Welcome back to the Green Rush. I'm your host today. I am Josh Kincaid, generally hosting the Talking Hedge podcast, Cannabis Business Podcast. Jimmy is out, so you're stuck with me. We're talking everything about cannabis today. We started off with cultivation. Now we're going to talk about, or we talked about genetics. Now we're going to talk about cultivation, everything that is growing. We've got a couple of folks here from Washington State, my backyard, as well as Tennessee. Uh, so that's going to be interesting to talk to them. I don't know anything about Tennessee cultivation. So we're going to jump into some uh, interesting topics all about growing. Um, quick introductions with uh, with Bill and Sean. Uh, you guys are with Washington Bud Company. Um, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. having us, Josh. Thanks for having us. Yeah, what do you want to know about growing weed? <laughs> um, you know, all, all about it. So you guys jumped in in the medical industry, right? And so with that, it's been at least uh, almost 10 years, I'd say, since 2016, I think is when Washington went went uh, legit. Um, tell me a little bit about that whole part about getting into the industry, what it's like, because we don't have vertical integration in Washington. So you only grow and then make products, but you don't sell them. You have to have a retailer do that. So talk, walk me through the whole process of, of, of starting. You're in the medical days, you switch over. What was that like in, in both scenarios and where you at now? Yeah, uh, so in, in uh, 2010, Bill and I went to Hempfest and saw what was going on. And you know, at that time, the medical marijuana bill that Jeannie Cole Wells had sponsored was, was being talked about. And, uh, you know, and it actually passed the House and Senate in 2011. So we thought we had a legit medical marijuana bill. Then the governor might have vetoed out everywhere the Department of Health or Department of Ag was supposed to oversee this program. And we ended up with the mess of a medical market that we had and and it really wasn't very legalized <laughs> you were taking a chance i mean there was no regulations there was no uh security that you were going to be you could not get in trouble you could not get arrested you could not get charged with something so it was really a loosey goosey set setup yeah know? and some people paid taxes and some people didn't we chose to pay taxes on our sales like our regular business that we own in washington because that kind of covers your ass right Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, you know, fa fast forward, we branded back in 2012. So we were one of only five brands in medical that actually branded. And so, so we were really lucky that way because we established the brand. Bud tenders have been uh, smoking us for a long time. And we had a lot of time to figure out the strains, right? What we wanted to grow, what people like to smoke, what looked pretty, what grew well in our system, all of those things. So when we hit 502, we were in medical June of 2016, and we were in rec the next month in July of 2016 with mm. our brand. And uh, yeah, so we, could, we couldn't ask for a better situation that we're wholesalers only, you know, because the whole vertical integration, that really, uh, it's not conducive to mom and pop business, basically. You know, I mean, you yeah, got to have deep, deep pockets for that. Kind of before stuff. I dive too much into that, I do want to kind of point out that you're growing for X amount. And then how much is that retailer adding to that? Is it 3X? Usually three, sometimes 3.4, 3.5. There's even stores that'll go four. Because out of that, uh, they've got to pay the 37% tax plus the 10% tax on top of that. So basically a 47% tax on everything that they sell and then they've got to have you know about a third of that to pay for their employees that aren't deductible on 280e because they sell weed so mm -hmm. you know you can't deduct that and so yeah it's it's necessary to have that much of a markup um in this state and it's okay because you can still buy a really good eighth of weed for 45 bucks yeah out the door with it's taxes. just sad for for everybody else who you know if you sell a $48 ounce, and then you're only able to sell it for, for 10 bucks. It's tough. Um, let's, let's talk to the, to the folks over at flow garden in Tennessee. Cause they're about almost 10 years behind you guys in, in Washington as, as they grow and roll out and go through all of these other issues from the medical days where you can kind of do what you want to the more regulated market where there's not a whole lot of clear pathways. So I want to welcome the guys from flow garden. Uh, do we have David or Eric? This is Eric. Eric, how are you, man? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for having us. Yeah, appreciate it. Uh, so so tell me a little bit about Flow Garden. You you guys are out there in Tennessee doing your thing, and and how yeah. are you exactly doing that? So we're under the hemp laws, um, 
it's governed by the state and we're allowed to grow anything that's under 0.3 total THC. Um, so we focus a lot on alternative cannabinoids, you know, our CBDs, uh, CBGs, and then we also do type two flower, which is uh, equal parts THCA and uh, CBD. Okay. Are you guys vertically integrated? Or are you just a grower? How does that work down there for right now with this? I'm assuming it's kind of a pilot prod or it's not pilot, but just under the hemp. But exactly. Yeah. We're, we're pretty much vertically integrated at this point. Seed to sale. Uh, we work on genetics and uh, our indoor facility is around 20,000 square feet. So we put out about 200 pounds of indoor flour that we sell all around the country. So that's one good thing we can do is we can ship all around the country. We're in the, in the marijuana market not so much so are, are you trying to do any kind of d8 d9 any loopholes there and or are you trying to feel your way into cannabis through your own terroir and figure out what you can grow if or when that happens or are you just yeah I mean, that's the elephant in the room you know we're, we're positioning ourselves here for when it does if it does come legal one day we're, we have a, an established brand you know to go from uh we really haven't messed with d8 so much uh, I'm not a big fan. Uh, we do dabble with the uh, THCA. I'm sure you all heard of it, the new market, uh, where as long as it's below 0.3 Delta 9, which that doesn't really grow in the plant. So uh, we can get through that way. So uh, we've been doing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. Bill, Sean, you guys um, are are advocates and, and highly involved with the, the um, Cannabis Alliance and, and other events are, are um, networking groups mm -hmm. here um yeah uh, you guys were against d8 i believe i, I may make it there are we yeah. synthetics absolutely yeah absolutely um yeah when the when the cbd market got glutted and chemists could figure out a pretty easy way to to uh change the cbd molecule into into a delta molecule um you know that completely well, it, the, it, it hurt the market hard. The, the point of it is that the growers are under a lot of regulations. We're watched a lot with cameras. We're under uh, fenced off areas. We have inspectors come come around. I don't. I to me personally, I'm fine if as long as the bulk material comes from a regulated grow. But what was happening is, see, uh, uh, hemp was coming in from across the country, and processors with a processor license. We're turning it into a Delta 9 and selling it into our regulated stores. So the competition, it wasn't fair. It wasn't apples for apples as far as the fairness of it, as far as us being a grower. Uh, if, if, if a guy wants to grow hemp or hemp within our regulated market and he's he's under cameras, he's limited to square footage, and he wants to market that with inside our regulated 502 legal stores, I got no problem with that. But as soon as it comes in from China or from Tennessee, <laughs> uh, I got a problem with that because uh, they're they're growing in a lot cheaper situation than we are. We can't compete with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Not you got to compete on on. Um, well, a lot of people talk about the highest THC at the lowest price point. Finally, we're talking about uh, terpenes and and other properties to that. How do you guys pick your cultivars to get? The best. I was talking to Jerry Whiting before about genetics, and we've kind of just lost Blue Dream, and which was really popular. People really liked that effect, and then yet it's kind of like we don't really care. We're going to sell you a uh, green crack that's a high yield, even though it, it makes me super edgy, and I hate I hate the result of it. How do you guys pick? Because you guys are our, our top shelf brand here in Washington with Washington Budco. How do you go about picking your cultivars? And then Eric, I want to ask you the same thing. Well, you know, you've got to yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot of differences in the quality of, the, of marijuana. It's just like just like anything else. There's BMWs and there's Chevys, and you're going to find genetics that are just really good. They taste great. They give you a nice nice high or a really strong high, and they grow strong. Or you'll find genetics that are just sort of laying there flat, very little taste. So we picked our genetics years ago. We just have the same strains we've had for the last ten years. They were really good strains. Now, we've added some some over the years. We've done some uh, seeding, but it takes us a long time to find a pheno of a particular seed that we really like. I guess it's just our history of, of smoking weed for 50 years and what we think is really good quality quality marijuana, mm -hmm. uh, and that's how we basically get picked it. And mm -hmm. it's all about the genetics. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, 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 you could be the best grower in the world, but if you don't have good genetics, 
it's just going to be basic mm -hmm. everyday Chev Chevrolet marijuana. And you got to grow stuff that bud tenders want to smoke. And then when they want to smoke it, they recommend it. And then the whole circle works. The other thing right? about it too, is you've got to keep it fresh. You know, there's a lot of outdoor growers. They'll, they'll grow one season. Uh, they only have one growing season. We'll keep that around for six, seven, eight months. I don't care how well you store it. It's like, it's like bananas. It goes, it goes south those, fast. Those terpenes, will, you know, so, they're so much better when it's fresh. We harvest right? every four weeks. We sell out every four weeks. So it's constantly being fresh. We have, uh, we have very current harvest dates, which is a good selling mark, selling point for us. And it's fresh and it's spongy. You can, you can feel it. It's not hard rock. Uh, how you cure it is important. We keep it uh, in 65 degree rooms. Uh, just a lot of little, little, little things like that that help to help set our quality above a lot of the other more, other and, brands and, out there. And we're only growing a 2,500 square foot canopy. That's not yes. a lot. Eric, are you going outdoor, growing outdoors? No, strictly indoors. Strictly yeah. indoors, okay. And so how do you go about your your growing methodology like some people they'll grow tomatoes based on if it ships you know with thicker walls or the size of the product how many they could fit in a box or they don't care because they're going to blast it into oil when when you start from from you know indoor i would assuming you're spending a lot more money than somebody growing outdoors so you're i'm assuming you're you're focusing on that flower and, and end product but what's going through your head and, and how do you make those decisions yeah so we our brand is focused mainly on quality like we're trying to produce the highest quality plant out there and we're a little different because we can't grow high thc so we pheno hunt or i pheno hunt all the time like i've got 100 different cultivars right now i'm running through because in our market since it doesn't really get you high per se um it's all about the new flavors the new tastes the new smells um so i'm constantly coming up with new cultivars and then i have my stock like eight different ones that i run through that's that are good sellers but i'm always looking for the new the new flavor um because that's what our customers want at the end of the day so who, who is your target market is it is it um who's your target market and what are they looking for ultimately so our target market is mostly males from age 30 to 40 People that are a little older that smoke and straight marijuana, you know, it gives them paranoia, it gives them high anxiety. So they're looking for something a little bit less to help combat their anxiety. Um, and that that's our target market pretty much. Mm -hmm. so. Do you guys have any desire to uh, to switch or and or add cannabis? Uh, yeah, yeah, eventually. But but my main focus is type two flower, which, like I said, is equal parts THC and CBD, I believe that's the true medicine. It, it gives you everything you want out of marijuana, uh, except that CBD works with the THC and helps combat any kind of anxiety or paranoia that might come from normal normal uh, high THC. Yeah, so, I think so. everybody here is a huge fan of a one-to-one -one ratio or, or any ratio for that matter. One-to-one -one CBD, THC ratio is one of my favorites back in 2015 with um, a friend of mine, uh, Jerry Mead with a uh, happy cat. That's no longer around. They sold it to Florida, but um, first time I had that, I was like, wow, this is phenomenal. So huge, huge yeah. fan. Um, yeah. I'd lo love to get to know that strain, Eric. <laughs> yeah. Well, we have plenty of them. Yeah. We, I wouldn't mind sending you some cuts. I don't, I'll, I'll share some of my work. Um, I can even send y'all samples really. It doesn't matter. It's, it's amazing. Like it's something you can smoke all day long and still function, you know, and go throughout your day and feel great. So it was eye opening for me when I first tried it. Yeah, what's we're the, in what's such a thing? high THC market here. Yeah, yeah, the political landscape in in um, Tennessee is is it? Um, what are the folks on the ground think about it as well as the folks at the Capitol? As far as legalization, um, I think we're probably seventy percent uh, in favor for it, and capital the republicans are finally coming around democrats have been there so i feel like we're getting there the the tides are turning but you know it's been so i've been growing here for 29 years so it's hard to say i've kind of given up and just focused on what i can focus on here but hopefully in another couple of years we'll have some kind of medical program so. do you think you guys will be able to remain um in business 
growing indoors versus somebody who's outdoor, you know, organic, pesticide free. Um, Sean, Bill, I want to I want to start with you because you've been doing it for a while in a very, very competitive market. 1800 plus SKUs in any store at any one given time is a nightmare. And yet you guys still managed to be in business. How have you guys survived? Consistency. Consistency. He, he developed a schedule years ago. Every four weeks, like clockwork, we're pulling a harvest. And, uh, you know, and it's just the the cycle that the crew is in. Like right now, they're their second day of harvest down there and, and, uh, and they know in four weeks, they're going to be doing it all over again. And so we're able to move our crew around and be efficient, but consistency really, because when the consumer goes in and wants a Blackberry Kush or a Sky Master, that's blue dream, <laughs> right? you know, they want that same look and nug. They want the, that same terpene profile. They want that same effect. And uh, so we've been able to provide that. We, we only have nine strains in the market and eight for years and we just added a ninth. And I uh, think distribution is, is huge because you have all these football players starting CBD companies and yet they can't really make a lot of sales. It's like a social media influencer who can't sell a minimum of three dozen t-shirts. Like you can have a huge platform and yet you, you have this really hard time making sales. Um, so I think there's something to that whole approach of, of being able to distribute and not only that, but then actually converting uh, that product into sales. And it's not as easy as a lot of people think and they can kind of just grow mm -hmm. and then they will come. And it's, it's not like that yeah. at all. I, I've cautioned people through my advocacy for years. Don't grow anywhere and you can sell. It, it's just really pricey that way. <laughs> yeah. you know, And it's a lot more labor and, you know, cause labor will eat you alive. And then, and then, you know, I, I understand a lot of the country isn't paying into their uh, tax system and, you know, paying taxes on their labor, but we do, I, you know, I mean, we have to pay into Social Security and Medicare for all of our employees. And so, mm -hmm. um, but we've got a great crew. We've got, we've got uh, a crew of eight people and uh, they come in every day and they work hard and they get those orders out and do all the hand trimming and some days they're transplanting, some days they're, they're uh, watering, you know, so uh, we've got a really dynamic crew that works well together. So any, any issues or problems that, that you guys see there's, um, oh, what was that, that uh, hemp there is, it's going ongoing right now where it's, it's killing a lot of the crops. Eric, help me out. You know what the. Viroid hemp, 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 uh, hemp. Yeah. Hop latent uh, viroid. Yeah, yes. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Is that how much of an issue is that hop latent virus to destroy products? Because you hear you hear about it, and I want to know the reality of it. And there's there's articles all the time about fentanyl laced cannabis. I'm laughing because it seems so ridiculous, but um, I actually have a buddy who who got high and he tested himself and he went positive for fentanyl, and he yeah. only buys rec like retail Washington cannabis. Oh wow. <laughs> And so he's down in Tacoma. Yeah. So he was, he was withdrawing and had to go into the hospital for withdrawing off of fentanyl. So I hear about it. I laugh about it because it seems so crazy and stupid, but how, how much of an impact is that hop latent virus and other crazy stories? I think it sounds like a lot of crazy stories because a lot of research hasn't been really completed on it yet. I, you can hear pros and cons both ways. I've heard that it's not really that big a deal, but I've also heard that it's very, that is a, a concern. So, you know, we're fighting something all the time, right? Whether it's spider mites or root aphids or, or thrips or environmental control. I mean, you know, you've got to stay high humidity. I mean, it's just such a balance when you're growing indoors, but mm -hmm. you know, we can pull down 13 harvests a year. So I just it saw on Facebook, there was a, out of Ohio, there was an eighth, a uh, little plastic jar of an eighth and it was spider mites all over it. Generally, yeah. you got to crack those open in order to see the <laughs> hidden ones, you know, but the fact that they just threw those in there and they're like, forget about it. So I have actually, you ever I, snap crackle popped in a bowl, right? <laughs> with, with, maybe with a seed. Yeah, but not not spiders. No, but I, I refuse to buy cannabis the week before, during or after 420 now. That three week period, I found so much spider mites and mold and disgusting stuff. People, I think, just wait and they're like, here you go, suckers. 
Huh. Dump, dumping the bad stuff for cheap, right? Yeah, man. Eric, yeah. what's up with the hop latent virus? Have you had any issues in your industry? You know, people you know. I've only heard it about it in the marijuana industry. The hemp industry, uh, knock on wood, I haven't I haven't had any problems. I've sent uh quite a few. We sell clones, so everything we sell, we send off to get tested, and so far I've been clean. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's just something they're throwing out there if it's an act i'm sure it's an actual thing i guess but i haven't had any experience with it yeah yeah and the article that i read said that it's really prevalent in like northeastern states um along mm -hmm. that along the coast so yeah maybe that's new california or, I, yeah. I don't know the, we, we seem to like our mold to gold theory over here. They'll just throw it in a jar in the Northeast and down here, we'll just blast it into, into extracts or something. I I don't know. It's not, it's not my thing. Uh, you guys have any opinions about the mold to gold? Like I know everyone says it's, it's okay. And the mold all gets, you know, removed through these filtrations. But if you just start with good product, I don't see why you need to take a moldy banana and create a, a delicious smoothie out of it. Like I'm good. Uh-uh. That's probably by uh, they have to do it. See, they have to throw it away, you know. So I prefer you throw it away. That's my <laughs> preference. Oh yeah, we we haven't had bud rot mold for so long. It's like yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, we we wouldn't take the chance of alienating our customer base right now. I mean, that would seem like a illogical business decision. Yeah. Uh, so tell me a little bit about some of the hurdles that you guys are seeing. I know Washington, they love you guys running around like chickens with your head cut off to make you think that they're going to limit a THC um, concentrates at 10% or limit your products based on crazy shapes or colors because it's attracted to kids. Um, what, what, what are some of the hurdles that you guys are facing now other than just the fierce competition in either Washington or Tennessee in your respective fields? Well, they're looking at changing our traceability system for the fourth, fifth time. <laughs> so, you know, have, I uh, sit on the executive board of the Cannabis Alliance, and so we're keeping our ear real close to regulations and legislation. And so, um, you know, this in this state, they took away uh, agricultural uh, exemptions and everything from cannabis back in 2014 because they were really scared of what was going to go on, right? Well, we're... 10 years. So, you know, we, we need some exemptions and some help like any other small business in Washington has, you know, we have to pay taxes on our cost of goods for goodness sakes, you know, no other business has to do that. So, you know, the state's the only one really raking in the winnings at a, at a basically 47% tax on every dollar sold. Right. And so it's time for them to start looking at us uh, with respect as, as business people and, and give us the benefits of being Washington citizens and Washington small business owners. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I'm really going to be focused on this year. Mm -hmm. What about out in Tennessee, Eric? Uh, so out here, the governor just signed a bill in about two months ago to regulate all the hemp derived products, um, put a tax on it. I feel bad even saying after what you just said yours was, it's a 6% tax, um, mm -hmm. but they all child proof packaging and uh no animal shapes no unicorns anything like that geared towards children so that they just put that in effect uh july 1st so this month so they're just trying to make it like an actual product but it's just our way of doing things i guess for now <laughs> mm -hmm. Is there anything that would alleviate all of your issues? People talk a big game about, um, you know, the the Safe Banking Act, even though I don't think that that's the end-all be-all. What is the end-all be-all in your opinion? What would solve all of the problems? <laughs> well, first of all, to give her that Safe Banking Act would be a big, big plus, and also the 280E tax burden at the retailers. We, 280E doesn't affect us, but it certainly affects the retailers. And in this state, the retailers really have all the power They've got the, they're pretty much dictating the price. If you want in your, if you want in their store, you better either have a really good product, really good business sense, or be able to lower your price right to the dime, right to the nickel and dime. So those guys are struggling. 280E and 280E would help them a lot. Um, Safe banking would help us because then we could access a lot of assets and a lot of equity. Yeah, right now. Buildings. So yeah, we can't, we can't. If take we get, out a mortgage and right? then if we can also 
<laughs> less of the regulations like okay let's 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 treat it like potato chips we don't need cameras and fenced off areas and all those ridiculous rules and regulations i mean traceability actually keep track of every single gram that's it's, it's a joke it's impossible you, there's no way in the world you can keep track of it and who cares i mean so what Where, where's that taking you what's that solving sometimes a lot of these things are just fear-based and, and those fear-based regulations cost us money and labor mm -hmm. and that, that helps the bottom line for sure so we're going after plant tags at the cannabis alliance the single use plastic plant tags that they make us put on any plant that's higher than eight inches right mm -hmm. my gosh you, you just roll through those and they just you know create waste that is unnecessary yeah i hope some of the retailers aren't watching this because i've resorted to um uh, costume changes i will literally go into a store wearing what i'm wearing and go out and do a costume change and go back in because i can only buy one ounce at a time <laughs> So until I meet like that new bud tender who doesn't know what the rules are, I'm like, oh, you're new? I'd like two, please. <laughs> that'd be uh, nice. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Too. Eric, what would alleviate all of your issues out in Tennessee? Is there like a magic wand that you could just like hit somebody on the head with and solve all your problems? I wish. <laughs> I mean, if they would just raise this limit from 0.3% total, it's almost like you can't even grow a plant that, that's not, well you can't really unless it's cbg at post harvest if they could just raise that to one percent two percent give us a little bit of wiggle room that would help tremendously and then obviously the elephant in the room if they could just get us some sort of medicinal program here or anything like that would help tremendously i feel like we're living in the dark ages out here you know, we're just trying to grow plants for a living so well if somebody wants to help you out eric and or collaborate with you or just find your products and buy it how can they get a hold of you where are you at uh you can go on our website flowgardens.com we shipped all 50 states and then we have an instagram it's flowgardens420 underscore 2.0 because our other one got deleted and um yeah yeah so check us out there okay and then sean and eric <laughs> you guys all 50 states <laughs> You, yeah, right. Uh, WashingtonBudCo.com or where are you guys at? WaBudCo. Yeah, we're WaBudCo.com. Yeah, okay. yeah. And we only serve 30 stores and uh, mostly around Lake Washington and some a little south, some a little north. But uh, yeah, we live on a pot farm and we, we really love it. <laughs> yeah, you live on your farm. Yeah, like that's, uh -huh. I think you're one of the only one in the entire state that has that ability. Or you guys, when you were at Washington Marijuana Association way back in the day, fighting yeah. for it, they were going to try and change the, like the 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 lines, and it was going to be like on the other side of your. You had to move. You're going to have to move. I remember, like I don't know if you remember, but it was like nine nine years ago or something, and all kinds of crazy stuff. So anybody who's watching in a newly emerging state, you got a lot of fun stuff to. Uh, look forward to so maybe hit up you know sean bill or eric and uh, ask them about their petri dish experiment because um know uh, your zoning know your zoning codes yeah. and yeah. protect them um because those county and city councils they can go in and change those codes and all of a sudden you're blocked out so yeah. gotta make damn sure the place that you're growing on when you get legal yeah. accepts you in their in their zone that's my best advice to anybody across any state <laughs> yeah. Get involved and, and talk to people who have done it. It'll save you a lot of time and money. But with that, I think we're going to have to roll this one up. So I want to thank my guests, Sean Dene, uh, Bill Wag uh, Wagonseller, uh, both with Washington Bud Company. Uh, Eric, um, is it Melzer? Yep, perfect. Eric Melzer with uh, with Flow Garden out in Tennessee. Man, appreciate all you guys being on with us here at the Green Rush produced by Pro Cannabis Media every Friday live from 4 to 6. With that, we're going to roll this one up. I'm Josh Kincaid. This is The Talking Hedge. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe or don't. And I'm out. Don't forget to smash that like button on your way out and check out these other videos that we've got.